The two of them lived just outside the village. They were both called Sinjilfa, and they usually distinguished as Old Sinjilfa and Little Sinjilfa. They themselves addressed each other only as Sinjilfa. This was a habit of long standing. Old Sinjilfa was something over 50, Little Sinjilfa only just over 12. They were close together, the pair of them, each felt lost without the other. It had been like that ever since little Sinjilfa could remember. His father could look further back. He remembered that 13 years ago he had lived on his farm within easy riding distance of the village. He had a good wife and three sturdy and hopeful children. Then his luck turned as a disaster struck him. His sheep went down with pest, his cattle died of anthrax and other diseases. Then the children got whooping cough and all three died, close enough together to lie in one grave. To pay his debts Sinjilfa had to give up his farm and sell the land. Then he bought the land on the point just outside the village, knocked up a cabin divided into two by a partition, and a fish drying shed. When that was done, there was enough left to buy a cockle shell of a boat. This was the sum of his possessions. It was a poor and dismal life they led there, Sinjilfa and his wife. They were both used to hard work, but they had no experience of privation and constant care for tomorrow. Most days it meant putting to see if they were to eat, and it was not every night they went to bed with a full stomach. There was little enough left over for clothing and comfort. Sinjilfa's wife worked at fish drying for the factor in the summer months, but good drying days could not be counted on and the money was not much. She lived just long enough to bring little Sinjilfa into the world, and the last thing she did was to decide his name. From then on, father and son lived alone in the cabin. Little Sinjilfa had vague memories of times of desperate misery. He had to stay at home through days of unrelieved torment and agony. There had been no one to look after him while he was too small to go off in the boat with his father, and old Sinjilfa was forced to tie the boy to the bedpost to keep him out of danger in his absence. Old Sinjilfa could not sit at home all the time. He had to get something to put in the pot. The boy had more vivid memories of happier times, smiling summer days on a sea glittering in the sunshine. He remembered sitting in the stern and watching his father pulling in the gleaming fish. But even those times were mingled with bitterness, for there were days when the sky wept and old Sinjilfa rode out alone. But in time little Sinjilfa grew big enough to go off with his father, whatever the weather. From then on they contentedly shared most days and every night, neither could be without the other for more than a minute. If one of them stirred in his sleep, the other was awake on the instant, and if one could not get to sleep, the other did not close his eyes either. One might think that it was because they had a lot to talk about that they were so wrapped up in each other. But that was not so. They knew each other so well and their mutual confidence was so complete that words were unnecessary. For days on end no more than scattered phrases fell between them, they were as well content to be silent together as to be talking together. The one need only look at the other to make himself understood. Among the few words that passed between them, however, was one sentence that came up again and again, when old Sinjilfa was talking to his son. His words were, the point is to pay your debt to everybody, not owe anybody anything, trust in providence. In fact, father and son together preferred to live on the edge of starvation rather than buy anything for which they could not pay on the spot and they tacked together bits of old sacking and patched and patched them so as to cover their nakedness, burdened by debt. Most of their neighbors were in debt to some extent, some of them only repaid the factor at odd times, and they never repaid the whole amount. 
but as far as little St. Julfa knew, he and his father had never owed a penny to anyone. Before his time, his father had been on the factor's books like everyone else, but that was not a thing he spoke much about and little St. Julfa knew nothing of those dealings. It was essential for the two of them to see they had supplies to last them through the winter, when for many days gales or heavy seas made fishing impossible. The fish that had to last them through the winter was either dried or salted, what they felt they could spare was sold, so that there might be a little ready money in the house against the arrival of winter. There was rarely anything left and sometimes the cupboard was bare before the end of the winter, whatever was eatable had been eaten by the tune spring came on, and most often father and son knew what it was like to go hungry. Whenever the weather was fit, they put off in their boat but often rowed back empty-handed or with one skinny flat fish in the bottom. This did not affect their outlook. They never complained, they bore their burden of distress as heavy as it was, with the same even temper. As they showed in the face of good fortune on the rare occasions it smiled on them, in this, as in everything else, they were in harmony. For them there was always comfort enough in the hope that, if they ate nothing today, God would send them a meal tomorrow, or the next day. The advancing spring found them pale and hollow-cheeked plagued by bad dreams, so that night after night they lay awake together. And one such spring, a spring moreover that had been colder and stormier than usual, with hardly a single day of decent weather, evil chance paid another visit to old St. Julfa's home. Early one morning a snow slip landed on the cabin on the point, burying both father and son. By some inexplicable means little St. Julfa managed to scratch his way out of the drift. As soon as he realized that for all his efforts he could not dig his father out single-handed, he raced off to the village and got people out of their beds. Help came too late, the old man was suffocated when they finally reached him through the snow. For the time being his body was laid on a flat boulder in the shelter of a shallow cave in the cliffside nearby, later they would bring a sledge to fetch him into the village. For a long time little St. Julfa stood by old St. Julfa, and stroked his white hair, he murmured something, as he did it, but no one heard what he said. But he did not cry and he showed no dismay. The men with the snow shovels agreed that he was a strange lad, with not a tear for his father's death, and they were half inclined to dislike him for it. He's a hard one, they said, but not in admiration. You can carry things too far. It was perhaps because of this that no one paid any further attention to little St. Julfa. When the rescue party and the people who had come out of mere curiosity made their way back for a bite of breakfast and a sledge for the body, the boy was left alone on the point. The snow slip had shifted the cabin and it was all twisted and smashed, posts missing their lots stuck up out of the snow, tools and household gear were visible here and there, when he laid hold of them, they were as if bonded the snow. Sinjulfa wandered down to the shore with the idea of seeing what had become of the boat. When he saw with what cold glee the waves were playing with its shattered fragments amongst the lumpy masses of snow below high water mark, his frown deepened, but he did not say anything. He did not stay long on the shore this time. When he got back to the cave, he sat down wearily on the rock beside his dead father. It's a poor lookout, he thought, he might have sold the boat if it hadn't been smashed. Somewhere he had to get enough to pay for the funeral. Sinjilfa had always said it was essential to have enough to cover your own funeral. There was no greater or more irredeemable disgrace than to be slipped into the ground at the expense of the parish. Fortunately, his prospects weren't so bad, he had said. 
they could both die peacefully whenever the time came. There was the cabin, the boat, the tools and other gear, and finally the land itself. These would surely fetch enough to meet the cost of coffin and funeral service, as well as a cup of coffee for anyone who would put himself out so far as to accept their hospitality on that occasion. But now, contrary to custom, his father had not proved an oracle, he was dead and everything else had gone with him, except the land on the point. And how was that to be turned into cash when there was no cabin on it? He would probably have to starve to death himself. Wouldn't it be simplest to run down to the shore and throw himself in the sea? But then both he and his father would have to be buried by the parish. There were only his shoulders to carry the burden. If they both rested in a shameful grave, it would be his fault, he hadn't the heart to do it. Little St. Julfer's head hurt with all this hard thinking. He felt he wanted to give up and let things slide. But how can a man give up when he has nowhere to live? It would be cold spending the night out here in the open. The boy thought this out. Then he began to drag posts, pieces of rafter and other wreckage over to the cave. He laid the longest pieces sloping against the cave mouth. He badly wanted his father to be within four walls, covered them over and filled the gaps with bits of sailcloth and anything else handy, and finished by shoveling snow up over the whole structure. Before long it was rather better in the cave than out of doors, though the most important thing was to have St. Julfa with him for his last days above ground, it might be a week or more. It was no easy matter to make a coffin, and dig out frozen ground. It would certainly be a poor coffin if he had to make it himself. When little St. Julfo had finished making his shelter, he crept inside and sat down with outstretched legs close to his father. By this time the boy was tired out and sleepy. He was on the point of dropping off when he remembered that he had still not decided how to pay for the funeral. He was wide awake again at once. That problem had to be solved without more ado, and suddenly he saw a gleam of hope. It wasn't so unattainable. After all, he might meet the cost of the funeral and maintain himself into the bargain, at any rate for a start. His drowsiness fell from him. He slipped out of the cave and strode off towards the village. He went straight along the street in the direction of the store, looking neither to right nor left, heedless of the unfriendly glances of the villagers. Wretched boy, he didn't even cry when his father died. Were the words of those respectable, generous-hearted and high-minded folk. When little St. Jill forgot to the factor's house. He went straight into the store and asked if he might speak to the master. The storm instead and lingered before finally shuffling to the door of the office and knocking. In a moment the door was half opened by the factor himself, who, when he caught sight of little St. Julfer and heard that he wanted to speak to him, turned to him again and, after looking him up and down, invited him in. Little St. Julfa put his cap on the counter and did not wait to be asked twice. Well, young man, said the factor. The youngster nearly lost heart completely, but he screwed himself up and inquired diffidently. Whether the factor knew that there were unusually good landing facilities out in the point. It is much worse in your landing place than it is in ours out there. The factor had to smile at the gravity and spirit of the boy, he confessed that he had heard it spoken of. Then little St. Julfa came to the heart of the matter. If he let out the use of the landing place on the point to the factor for the coming summer, how much would he be willing to pay to have his Faroese crews land their catches there? Only for the coming summer, mind. Wouldn't it be more straightforward if I bought the point from you? Asked the factor, doing his best to conceal his amusement. 
Little Sinjilfo stoutly rejected this suggestion, he didn't want that. Then I have no home, if I sell the point, I mean. The factor tried to get him to see that he could not live there in any case, by himself, destitute, in the open. They will not allow it, my boy. The lad steadfastly refused to accept the notion that he would be in the open out there, he had already built himself a shelter where he could lie snug. And as soon as spring comes, I shall build another cabin, it needn't be big and there's a good bit of wood out there. But, as I expect you know, I've lost Sinjilfa, and the boat. I don't think there's any hope of putting the bits of her together again. Now that I've no boat, I thought I might let out the landing place, if I could make something out of it. The Farovis would be sure to give me something for the pot if I gave them a hand with launching and unloading. They could row most ways from there, I'm not exaggerating, they had to stay at home time and time again last summer, when it was easy for Sinjilfa and me to put off. There's a world of difference between a deep water landing place and a shallow water one, that's what Sinjilfa said many a time. The factor asked his visitor what price he had thought of putting on it for the summer. I don't know what the funeral will cost yet, replied the orphan in worried tones. At any rate I should need enough to pay for Sinjilfa's funeral. Then I should count myself lucky. Then let's say that, struck in the factor, and went on to say that he would see about the coffin and everything, there was no need for little Sinjilfa to fret about it any more. Without thinking, he found himself opening the door for his guest, diminutive though he was, but the boy stood there as if he had not seen him do it and it was written clear on his face that he had not yet finished the business that brought him, the anxious look was still strong on his ruddy face, firm featured beyond his years. When are you expecting the ship with your stores? The factor replied that it would hardly come tomorrow, perhaps the day after. It was a puzzle to know why the boy had asked, the pair of them, father and son did not usually ask about his stores until they brought the cash to buy them. Little Sinjilfa did not take his eyes from the factor's face. The words stuck in his throat, but at last he managed to get his question out, in that case, wouldn't the factor be needing a boy to help in the store? The factor did not deny it. But he ought to be past his confirmation for preference, he added with a smile. It looked as if little Sinjilfa was ready for this answer, and indeed his errand was now at an end, but he asked the factor to come out with him round the corner of the store. They went out, the boy in front, and on to the pebble bank nearby. The boy stopped at a stone lying there, got a grip of it, lifted it without any obvious exertion and heaved it away from him. Then he turned to the factor. We call this stone the weakling. The boy you had last summer couldn't lift it high enough to let the damp in underneath, much less any further. Oh, well then, seeing you are stronger than he was, it ought to be possible to make use of you in some way, even though you are on the wrong side of confirmation, replied the factor in a milder tone. Do I get my keep while I'm with you? and the same wages as he had, continued the youngster, who was the sort that likes to know where he stands in good time. But of course, answered the factor, who for once was in no mood to drive a hard bargain. That's good, then I shan't go on the parish, said little Sinjilfa, and was easier in his mind. The man who has got something to pot in himself and on himself isn't a pauper, Sinjilfer often used to say that, he added, and he straightened himself up proudly and offered his hand to the factor, just as he had seen his father do. Goodbye, he said. I shall come then, not tomorrow but the days after. 
the factor told him to come in again for a minute and leading the way to the kitchen door, he ushered little Sinjilfer into the warmth. He asked the cook if she couldn't give the snipper here a bite of something to eat, preferably something warm, he could do with it. Little Sinjilfer would not accept any food. Aren't you hungry? asked the astonished factor. The boy could not deny that he was, and for the rest he could hardly get his words out with the sharpness of his hunger wetted still keener. By the blessed smell of cooking. But he resisted the temptation, I'm not a beggar, he said. The factor was upset and he saw that he had set about it clumsily. He went over to the dog youngster, patted his head and, with a nod to the cook, led little Sinjilfa into the dining room. Have you never seen your father give his visitors a drink or offer them a cup of coffee when they came to see him? He asked, and he gave his words a resentful tone. Little Sinjilfa had to confess that his father had sometimes offered hospitality to a visitor. There you are then said the factor. It's just ordinary good manners to offer hospitality, and to accept it. Refusing a well-meant invitation for no reason can mean the end of a friendship. You are a visitor here, so naturally I offer you something to eat. We have made an important deal and, what's more, we have come to terms over a job. If you won't accept ordinary hospitality, it's hard to see how the rest is going to work out. The boy sighed, of course, it must be as the factor said. But he was in a hurry. Sinjilfa was by himself out on the point. His eyes wandered round the room, then he added, very seriously, the point is to pay your debts, not owe anybody anything, and trust in providence. There was never a truer word spoken agreed the factor, and as he said it he pulled his handkerchief out of his pocket. He's a chip of the old block, he muttered, and putting his hand on little Sinjilfer's shoulder, he blessed him. The boy was astonished to see a grown man with tears in his eyes. Sinjilfer never cried, he said, and went on, I haven't cried either since I was little. I nearly did when I knew Sinjilfer was dead. But I was afraid he wouldn't like it, and I stopped myself. A moment later, tears overwhelmed little Sinjilfer. It is a consolation, albeit a poor one, to lean for a while on the bosom of a companion.